Hello, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Computer Sound and Music. I hope you're doing well out there. So today we're going to pick up where we left off last time. We've talked about the continuous Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform very briefly. And now we're going to sort of dive into a few of the details we've skipped over and talk a little bit about what you actually do with one of these things once you have them. And with that, we will have more or less covered that topic and move on to the next thing. So this is sort of the downhill stretch. If you followed everything we've done so far, I think you'll find this lecture super pleasant. So when we last chatted, we were talking about the discrete Fourier transform, which is sort of this idea of a discrete frequency domain representation for a discrete time domain PCM signal. So we've got the, uh, uh, frequencies here, x sub k, measured as complex numbers, being computed by this loop that loops over the samples, multiplying them by these funny coefficients. And that's the DFT. And one of the problems I mentioned at the end of last, lec last lecture that we should dive into a little more is this problem that this equation assumes that these n samples cover exactly one period of the overall signal. That is, when you just get to the end of your samples, you're just ready to start the next uh, signal. And that sounds great, but in practice, of course, before you start the DFT, you typically don't know what the period of the signal is. And so you're going to screw up. You're going to end up with a signal that starts at one level and ends at another level. And so we need to do something about that. And the trick that we use, that I think I briefly mentioned last time, is windowing, which is this idea of sort of tapering off the signal by multiplying it by a window function. That's a function that is big in the middle of your sample and, you know, of your signal and small toward the ends. And the idea of that is we'll taper things off so that we sort of enforce an overall period on the signal that's exactly the length of the thing. So, for example, we might use a half cycle of a sine wave, right? A sine wave starts at zero, goes up to one, and then goes smoothly back down to zero. And that might be a reasonable window function. Uh, the if we look at it sort of plotted graphically, what we see is something that looks like this. Um, so this is a 50 hertz sine wave plotted as a thousand samples. And you can see the purple thing here is the little bars representing the actual discrete samples in this signal. The little blue you can barely see at the edges is sort of the overall envelope if it were a continuous time signal. And what you notice is that, you know, the signal is treated as being pretty large in the middle, but smaller toward the ends. And so even if it doesn't match up quite right, then you are going to be able to, uh, you're going to be able to uh, ignore that because things will match up. It'll look like a, a cyclic signal to the FFT. And so basically FFTs are always windowed. You, it's very rare that what you want is not to do this. It's sort of a necessary thing to do. Let's see what happens if we um, actually take this uh, signal with GNU plot here and replot it uh, but this time we'll make it not come out even. Uh, we'll make it come out so that it ends uh, sort of a half cycle in. And we get a signal that's a lot, it's a lot harder to see what's going on. Let's go ahead and add to that again the, uh, the uh, envelope signal. Um, there now it's a little easier to see what it looks like and those weird little bumps in it are because we aren't sampling the signal quite often enough i probably need to fix that but uh 
And by the way, that's a real thing. Sampling artifacts like that happen all the time. But you can sort of see that even though the signal ends on a half sine wave, it doesn't matter because the windowing function is sort of rounded it off to nothing there. So that's cool. Now the problem with that is that the uh, window also acts as a low pass filter. Because you're filtering off a lot of the signal out at the ends for, for high frequencies, but you're not for low frequencies because they fit sort of in the window, um, you're gonna get the window itself acting like a low pass filter, which sounds great if you want a low pass filter or something. It turns out windowing filters are a real thing, but they aren't that great of filters. Mostly it's an annoyance when you're trying to actually understand the spectrum of something. Um, there's a billion window functions. If you look at the Wikipedia article I've linked, they talk about, I don't know, probably 50 different, I don't know, huge number of different windowing functions that people use. And every one of these window functions in this giant list of window functions, here's the triangular window, which is very easy to compute, but kind of doesn't do that well. Um, here's the Parson window, which is a window that has does a better job of smoothing the thing, but is going to be lossier. And so they're all going to have these trade-offs in how they filter the signal. And so what you'd really like is one that does a great job of being a windowing function, but a, ter but a terrible job of being a low-pass filter, and that's really, really hard to achieve. So there you are. Uh, and really picking a window function, the best window function, whatever that even means, is sort of a black art. And we won't really be talking about it in this course. Honestly, for everything we're going to do in here, a triangular window would work okay. Uh, pick a window that's easy to compute or one that's in some library of windowing functions you have. If you really want to get into this, you know, we could spend two weeks just talking about windowing functions and how they work. But not windowing an FFT is usually a cardinal sin that will give you garbage results. Another thing that I really wanted to talk about, because it's one of my favorite DSP things for audio, you know, we can sort of think of the, the bins, right, don't actually, it turns out they actually spill over into neighboring bins. So the amplitude at some given bin of the FFT isn't going to represent just that frequency. It'll also have some leakage from the frequencies around it. And you sort of overall can think of it as looking like uh, this, like a, like a bunch of overlapped Gaussians. And so, you know, frequencies in here will appear in both these bins, but they'll also, because they're really Gaussian, appear clear over here or over here somewhere. And that brings up an interesting point. Something I said last time is that if I just wanted one filter, a little narrow bandpass filter, where well, I could just compute one bin and now I've got a Gaussian bandpass filter. And this is a pretty efficient filter. So I just take this equation, run it for some fixed K that I want to do. And now I know what the signal looks like at that frequency and around, right around it. Um, bandpass filters are a really useful thing. And this thing, which is called a Gertzel filter after the person who sort of created it, is really nice. And it's really simple. If you already have a DFT implementation, you just throw away all but the one bin. Um, so yeah. Now, the one of the problems with this is that, with the DFT, is that if you're going to compute all the bins, you've got n bins. Each bin requires looping over n samples. And so that's an n squared algorithm. And n squared isn't the end of the world. It's at least poly time, so it's feasible. But if you're trying to do these in a hurry, you'd really like to do something faster. And it turns out there's a very clever algorithm called the fast Fourier transform, which computes the exact same answer as the DFT, the sort of basic DFT we've shown, but it achieves n log n complexity which is fantastic, right? Um, the difference between n squared and n log n is dramatic. If I'm trying to do a 4K FFT, 
right, then that's, um, you know, the difference between 16 million computations and uh, 4K times 12 is about, you know, 50K computations. Um, so 50K is better than a million. The FFT is fast. And the nice thing about it is that as a user of the FFT, you really don't have to care because it's supposed to compute the exact same answer as the ordinary DFT, uh, as the sort of brute force DFT. So when we're trying to get the whole spectrum, we usually use the FFT. And the DFT is sort of the theoretical thing we think about. When we actually implement it on a computer, we implement an FFT, except we don't. It's quite tricky to implement. It's sort of a weird black box. It uses all kinds of strange operations. It's a very clever algorithm. And if you're a graduate student teaching, taking the graduate's algorithms course, you may look at the, D at the FFT at some point, but it's really sort of a graduate level algorithm in my opinion. Um, but that's okay. Black boxes are cool. Libraries are around. There's a billion libraries out there for computing FFTs, and I would encourage you to use one when you want to compute the discrete Fourier transform. One of the limitations of the FFT in the process of making it fast, though, is that the DFT, I can sort of pick my number of samples, my capital N, to be anything I want. I don't really care how many samples I'm computing the DFT over. It'll work for all of them. Um, the FFT's clever algorithmic trick sort of requires that the number of samples you're computing the DFT for be a power of two. Um, now that's a little bit of a lie. There's super fancy FFTs that sort of look at the prime factors of the number of samples you're using. And if you have a lot of small factors, it can be almost as efficient as the DFT on powers of two sizes. But yeah, A. Um, so, and B, uh, you know, that's not necessarily going to be more convenient. So we typically work in powers of two. That's the normal plan. There are some tricks for FFTs. I should probably add one more lecture to this lecture series at some point, which is the lecture where we do the tricks for working with non-power of two sizes and some things like that. But I mean, the cool thing is that since powers of two have many of the smallest factor, that gives you the most efficient thing and that's the easy thing to do. And so most FFT libraries are secretly internally, even if you ask for a non-power two, give it a non-power of two number of samples, going to compute an FFT rounded up to the next larger size. So if I ask for a 514 point FFT, it will do a 1024 point FFT and give you back the answer. Um, Another limitation of the FFT, the DFT, I can sort of set the bin centers wherever I want. That's not quite true, but it sort of is. And in particular, when we look at music later, and when, when we were talking about sat, human hearing earlier, right? Frequencies are logarithmic, right? Every one octave up represents a doubling in the frequency. And so you'd really often like log-spaced DFTs, uh, log-spaced frequency DFTs. Uh, FFT doesn't do that. The, there again, the clever algorithmic trick that makes it fast insists that all the frequencies be linear. Um, and that's too bad because you might end up throwing a lot of bins away if you don't need so many at the bottom. Uh, but having said that, like I say, the FFT, the DFT is sort of the workhorse of the frequency domain and the FFT is sort of the workhorse algorithm for computing DFTs. Now, the other thing you may have noticed is that phase information is not that interesting. There's a lot of ways to, normally you just sort of care about the amplitude of various frequencies and you don't care about their relative phases. If that's the case, you can compute, there's efficient versions of the FFT which don't do quite so much computation and don't compute the phase. Or you can go to something called the discrete cosine transform, which is, similar to the FFT, but it only gives magnitudes and it has a little bit different boundary conditions. And so it gives you a little different answer, but it's still an N log N algorithm like the FFT is. So you'll see people using the discrete cosine transform in signal compression, for example, uh, the, M the MPEG audio, you know, the MP3 audio standard um, 
uses DCTs instead of FFTs for compression. I really want to talk later in this course a bunch about compression. It's something I'm really interested in, but uh, you know, know that it starts a lot of times with getting a frequency domain representation of the sound you're trying to compress. Um, and again, compression, I don't mean in the sense of trying to compress the amplitude. I mean actually trying to represent the signal reasonably in a fewer number of bits than a wave file would take. Now, once you start looking at signals in the frequency domain, you're going to notice some really common patterns um, because, you know, there's a lot of signals. We've been playing with sinusoids and sinusoids and sinusoids in here, and that's great. But it's really common to find other waveforms in nature, and it's interesting to think about in the frequency domain how they're built up out of sine waves. So for example, you'll see triangles and square waves a lot because they're easy to produce and because they sound interesting. And those turn out to be fundamentals plus odd harmonics. So a harmonic is sort of some multiple of the fundamental frequency. So if I have some frequency f, odd harmonics of f would be 3f, 5f, 7f, that sort of thing. And both the triangle and the square are composed of a fundamental wave at some fundamental frequency plus odd harmonics of that wave. The difference between the triangle square is the rate at which those harmonics decay and sort of the phase of those harmonics. So if we wanted to look at this, um, I've grabbed an audacity here. I've plotted a square wave, a uh, one kilohertz square wave. This is part of what it looks like. And a square wave is just what it sounds like. The sample is positive for a while and then it's negative for a while. And if you look at the frequency plot, the spectrum, the FFT, the DFT of this thing, here's what it looks like in sort of the DFT space. And one of the things you can notice is I mentioned that the bins sort of spill over. This thing is a 512 point FFT, so the precision's not that great. If we up it to a 4K FFT, the precision gets better, but it also gets hard to look at. Let's cut it back to 1024 point FFT. And now you can sort of start to see sharper peaks. So the point is that the more, there again, you know, the smaller, the narrower the bins, the better frequency resolution you have. But what you see is regardless, there's some spillover into neighboring bins. But the thing I really wanted to show you in this plot is this is the fundamental of the square wave at about one kilohertz. This is the first harmonic of the square wave, which is um, 22 dB down. No, sorry, this was at minus 3 dB, right? So this is at about half full amplitude. This is 22 dB down. So this is a log plot. This is um, the y-axis here is decibels. And so um, the, uh, you can see that it's already 22 dB down at the third harmonic. And then there, at the fifth harmonic, it's 36 dB down and, um, and uh, 28, 30, uh, 29. So, you know, these, these things fall off slowly. And that's what produces this characteristic square shape is sort of the adding up of these sine waves with the right amplitude. We sort of get these square corners as the sine waves add up in interesting ways. And so, um, that's you know that's that's sort of what the spectrum looks like for a si for a square wave and triangle wave spectrum looks similar. I could do the same thing again with a triangle wave. We could look at that, but an important thing to notice is that odd harmonics in particular are sort of characteristic of many kinds of distortion. You can also get even harmonics, but that's weirder. Um, and so. First of all, one implication of that is if you're trying to measure, say, a guitar's frequency, you got to watch out because there's going to be harmonics at all different multiples of the of the fundamental frequency of the guitar string. And in fact, when you tune a piano, the bass notes get tuned. The you know the the low note on a piano is so low frequency you can barely hear it and you certainly can't tell much about its frequency. It turns out the harmonics of that piano note, because the string doesn't vibrate perfectly, are actually up in the part of the frequency range you hear better. And so you have to do what's called stretch tuning of a piano, where you try to tune the string 
so that the harmonics sound like they're in tune. And that's difficult because the harmonics for something like a vibrating string are not evenly spaced like they are for this ideal square wave. And so you gotta pick a harmonic that sounds loud and tuned to that. And that's part of why they pay piano tuners more money than you would think and a computer doesn't just do all the piano tuning. Um, another sort of implication of this idea is that sort of if your amplifier isn't linear, for example, it's going to distort a sine wave that's put into it. And that distortion will show up typically as harmonics. And a real common measure of the distortion produced by an audio system, an amplifier, or what, a speaker, or whatever, is something called the total harmonic distortion. And it's basically just what we saw. You put in a sine wave that should have only a single peak in your spectrum, and you measure what's the power of the non-sine wave components that come out because of distortion. So this idea that harmonics are a thing is a really fundamental idea that falls out of looking at the frequency domain. Noise is also a, uh, a thing. If I actually ask um, the uh, audacity to generate noise, um, I can ask it for white noise at some amplitude, um, I don't know why it's set to 0.8 to 0.5 at half amplitude. So this is white noise 3 dB down and one second of that. And let's get rid of this square wave we don't need anymore. Let's get this sine wave, or sorry, this noise wave up here. And you notice it looks like noise. It doesn't look like anything. It's just a garble of stuff. And if I grow it out in, in time, well, you know, it's plotting it as lines up to a certain point and then it plots it as samples. You can see these samples are just literally random in that range. And so, you know, that's one of the first things we said about Fourier analysis is that frequencies are six are assumed to be cyclical. This is a good example of a signal that sort of doesn't have a period, right? I mean, maybe it does in some very, very abstract sense, but realistically, no, no, it doesn't. So, um, if you look at that square wave and you wonder what its frequencies are going to look like, then a good way to find that out is to once again just say plot spectrum on this thing. Let me select it again. Um, analyze plot spectrum. And... Hmm, that's odd. Clearly still have the sine wave one here. I've done this before. Um, there we go. Um, so what you see is that in the, in the time domain, it looks random. Hey, guess what? In the frequency domain, it looks random too. There's just random distribution of different frequencies across the spectrum. And if I ask this thing to generate noise again, um, you know, if I replace this with more generated noise, I will get a different chunk of noise this time. And when I replot that, you know, the peaks all shift around. It still looks random, but it's a different random spectrum. So noise sort of contains random frequencies at random amplitudes, sort of notionally. What it's what it really that is is a sign that this whole business of treating sound as composed of sine waves is sort of starting to break down in the noise world. Another thing you have to think about when you're thinking about the frequency domain is that, you know, there's this weird thing that happens, right? In the time domain, I can sort of say when a signal starts, right? If I, if I look at that square wave, sort of there's a specific instant in time, or at least within the resolution of one sample, where it jumps from minus 0.5 to 0.5. So we have a lot of information about the time of things, but we don't have any information about the frequency. The frequency domain is sort of the backwards of that, right? If I take a bunch of samples and do a DFT of them, literally all information about time is lost. All I know is that um, is what frequencies I'm looking at. And so, you know, that's kind of a problem, especially since, like I said before, you, you want better resolution, which means doing larger DFTs, but larger DFTs are less accurate and so i'm gonna have to 
I'm going to have a, a sort of a Heisenberg-y trade-off here where I, you know, I can either know the time of a signal happens or the frequency it's at, but I can't really know both at the same time. And it's, it's, that's called the frequency uncertainty principle, and it's a, uh, it's a uh, thing. Um, you know, I can sort of use a smaller DFT, less accurate. We'll miss low frequency signals in particular because they don't go over the whole period. Um, one way around this sort of, which isn't really a way around it, but is a very common thing to do, is sort of a heuristic where you do a small DFT which tells you sort of what the frequencies are in that range overall. You slide over maybe half half the DFT length or maybe just a few samples, and then you do it again. And so now if you think about it, you can get sort of a change of, you can sort of plot the change in frequencies over time and you can get some fuzzy idea, right? But with an abrupt change, you know, it's still not going to be very accurate, right? If I'm doing 512 sample DFTs and the signal, ch the note that I'm listening to uh, in music changes from a 440 tone to an 880, you know, to 880 tone, right? Um, then that's going to be a sudden change. And for a while, that window will contain part of the 440 and part of the 880. And so I'll get a mixture of both frequencies. And only when I've slid all the way over the um, all the way over the um, the 440 will I start getting pure 880 out. And so it's really hard to localize when that transition happened. And I can't tell the difference between that and a smooth transition between those notes. Um, the other problem, of course, is when we have abrupt changes in the signal. Well. Remember what we said about windowing just a bit ago? Now all of a sudden I'm going to get discontinuities, and dis discontinuities are going to show up in the FFT as noise sort of spread across the spectrum. So the FFT isn't a perfect tool. Frequency domain isn't a perfect place to live, but it's still incredibly powerful for the kinds of things we want to do with audio. Uh, you know, the first obvious thing is just do what we've just been doing. You you take your signal, you look for look at look at it with a DFT. And you try to decide what is this signal, what's going on. If you remember that square wave plot we had earlier, frequency domain square wave plot, you can sort of look at that and say, oh, I bet there's a square wave in there somewhere. And, you know, the time domain made that obvious because we had a pure square wave. But if I've got a square wave buried in a bunch of other stuff, it may be easier to find the fundamental and odd harmonics of the square wave than it is to sort of pick the square wave changes out of the other stuff that's going on in a noisy situation. Um, and I should say that, you know, sort of, but you still have to do the math. You still have to figure out what the spectrum means. And that's actually a whole field in itself. People make whole careers out of that kind of analysis. I should say that, you know, the DFT isn't the only tool for doing this stuff. There are more sensitive tricks if you know exactly what you're looking for than just brute force computing an FFT of your signal. But it's always the starting point. It's always the, there again, the sort of workhorse of doing that. Another thing that's sort of the focus of one of the next lectures is to actually change the amount of signal at various frequencies. Almost every audio piece of equipment you've seen, or at least a lot of them, have some kind of tone control. So you can make the sound, you can reduce the bass, you can reduce the treble, you can reduce the mid-range. You might have a multi-band equalizer. Well, all those things are sort of, let's emphasize certain frequencies and de-emphasize others. Well, that sounds like a frequency domain thing, right? I can compute a FFT, multiply the frequencies by, you know, numbers smaller or bigger than one, depending as I want to reduce or increase the frequencies. And then I can inverse transform it back into the time domain. And now I've got a signal that's been tone controlled. Now, there's some downsides, right, to this particular plan for filtering. One of them is that you know, we're going to have this overlapping window thing, and so we're either going to have a fairly expensive computation or really bad resolution or both as we try to figure out what it is we're even doing. Uh, another problem is that um, it, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's just an expensive approach no matter how you do it. The FFT is N log N, woohoo, but that's not great. Um, it turns out that we can do clever math if all we want to do is adjust the amount of various frequencies and short circuit a lot of the work the DFT and the inverse DFT are doing. And that's direct digital filtering. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. But, you know, if you just know exactly how you want to shape some signal in the frequency domain, it's hard to beat putting the signal, taking the signal from the time domain to the frequency domain, adjusting it, and then putting it back. The last app, another application that I, like I say, I really want to talk about sometime soon is this business of compression. And again, by compression, I mean reducing the size of the representation of a signal. Wave files get big really, really fast 16 bits per sample, 48,000 bits per samples per second uh, means what? Almost 100K um, per second of audio. And that, that starts to be a real thing, right? That's. Um, six megabytes a minute, that's, um, you know, 360 megabytes an hour. Um, not great. And that's for one channel. Um, you, you, you probably have two channel audio. So now we're up to almost a gigabyte an hour view. And so um, we'd like to sort of get rid of you know, find some representation that's smaller. And it turns out that since sound isn't usually noise, sound is usually represented by frequent, you know, a few frequencies rather than a lot of frequencies. Uh, a good way to start with the process of compressing is to save frequency domain representations instead of saving time domain representations. And a lot of things, including MP3, make heavy use of that idea. Um, another cool thing you can do when you're compressing is you can sort of throw away stuff that you can't hear. Now in the time domain that may mean small changes in large amplitudes, but you know there are games you can play there, but it turns out what it, if you know what frequencies you're adjusting, you really can just throw away frequencies that are too low to hear, to hear or too high to hear. You can absolutely say, well these frequencies are really close together, the ear isn't going to be able to tell them apart, so I'll just replace them with you know their average um, and that can get you really great compression that's how mp3 gets sort of 10x audio compression is by throwing away stuff mostly is by throwing away stuff that humans can't hear so that's the um, FFT uh, we still have more stuff we can talk about and probably should but at some point rather than overwhelm you with FFT stuff I prefer to go on to some other things and perhaps we'll come back to some of this later perhaps we won't the main thing is to get the idea of why you want to be doing dfts and to get the idea that finding a good fft library and learning how to use it is a good use of your time i hope this has been helpful again i hope you're all doing well and i will talk to you again soon thanks for listening